Hi, I'm Mauricio, and today I'm going to present some of our recent work on image deblurring. But first, let's try to understand what is image blur and where it comes from. Image blur appears on many different formats and strengths, and is a result of many different things. In any photograph, there's always a certain amount of intrinsic blur due to the optics and the camera capture in the photograph. But blur can be also be the result of wrongly setting the camera focus or when the autofocus system fails, or due to limited depth of field, typically when a large camera aperture is used. There's blur when there's relative motion between the camera and the target scene while capturing the photograph. For example, here, due to the cat moving. This also happens when the camera moves, for example, due to camera shake. Motion and camera shake blur typically occur in low light scenarios due to requiring exposures of dozens of milliseconds. So blur is a highly complex degradation that can be due to many different sources. And actually, these different types of blur have the very different mathematical properties. For example, lens blur is mostly isotropic and doesn't change significantly all over the image, while object motion is highly directional, non-isotropic, and changes abruptly depending on the object. Camera shake mo or motion blur can or can't be um, spatially variant, but in general they are highly non-isotropic. So it's very hard to model accurately blur. And on top of that, one of the main challenges is that we don't have an accurate model of the full degradation or the full processing of the, of the photograph. In particular, cameras do a lot of processing like demosizing, denoising, or even fusion of multiple images, right? There's gamma correction and nonlinear camera response function corrections. Additionally, in general, we share photographs, which means that the photos are going to be resized and compressed. So it's very hard to have like an accurate model of the whole processing introduced by a camera. So the goal of image deblurring is to generate a high quality image from a blurry input. For example, as the one we show here, right? We want to generate a clean, sharp restoration as this photograph. Image restoration and in particular image deblurring has been around for many decades. It got a lot of attention in the 80s and the 90s, but it's it has been around since early before. In the 50s and 60s, there's work, for example, by Denis Gabor on trying to reverse the heat equation in order to improve the sharpness of an image. And this is actually very related to image deep learning. And the classical methods, they try to model the degradation and the space of high quality images, right? And solve uh, a, a, a restoration problem based on these two things. The current trend is actually slightly different and it's based on using large amount of data and then, for example, training deep models in order to do this restoration. Image deep learning is an inverse problem. So what is an inverse problem? Well, the goal is to recover the latent clean signal. Here it's a high quality image represented by X given the observation y or our measurements and the idea is that we have this degradation model that is actually relating these two things signals the x that we don't know and the y that we are observing here this is represented by the degradation model a and the noise n so one challenge is that in many scenarios we don't actually know the blur we know the properties, but we don't know exactly the motion that lead to 
the blurry capture that we are observing. And additionally, right, what we're trying to do is invert this degradation operator A. But typically, this degradation is actually removing some details or information. So this is an ill-posed inverse problem where there are multiple high quality signals that can lead to the very same observation Y, right? So the typical or classical way of solving this inverse problem is by something known as variational formulation, where we try to develop an energy function that has multiple terms. One in typically is the data fitting terms that try to say, look, this is the observable image Y, and we are trying to find an X that is compatible to the degradation model, right? This is the first term here, data fitting, represented by the blue box. And then, additionally, in general, we have like multiple terms that are priors that, for example, tell us which image, which sharp image is more probable than others. For example, typical ways of modeling this is by saying that we are going to penalize the total variation of the sharp image. Additionally, in many scenarios, we don't know the exact degradation, so we may need to have like a, a prior term on this degradation, trying to enforce certain types of degradations. And once we have this energy function, then we need to solve a, an optimization problem, like trying to minimize this or find the x or the x and the degradation that minimizes this expression. And there are multiple ways of modeling this, the data fitting term, and in particular, the prior information. Typically, in the 80s, people were using total variation. Later, in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, we started seeing many other ways of, of modeling high quality signals by using wavelets or even sparsity, like sparse representation and dictionaries. And later, in the in, in later in the 2000s, we started seeing other type of work that tried to leverage ideas from other domains. For example, trying to use image denoisers as a, as priors as in red or plug and play methods, and more recently, trying to leverage uh, like generative models learned from data as good image priors. For example, using GANs or variation autoencoders or even diffusion models as priors. So what I'm going to present next is a different method that tries to solve this deep learning problem in very specific conditions. And this is what we call polyblur. With that, let me jump into polyblur, which is an algorithm we developed for handling mild blurring images. And this joint work with the computational imaging team at Google. Our goal is to remove mild blur, as the one you can see in the image on the left, and generate a more sharp image as the one you see on the right. And in particular, we want to remove mild blur without introducing any new artifact, and it should be able to run fast, for example, on a mobile device. So our current solution consists of three steps. First, we estimate the blur, then we apply, apply a deep learning stage. And then there's finally a final uh, step where we remove undesirable artifacts that we may have introduced during the deep learning. So here we're assuming that the blur is small and constant all over the image. In this setting, the blur can be characterized by a convolutional filter K. This model is reasonable in many situations, but it might be unrealistic if the blur is due to object motion or strong camera shake. And since we are targeting a small blur, instead of trying to accurately estimate a full blur kernel, what we're going to do is to parameterize the possible space of blurs using an isotropic Gaussian function, defined by three parameters, an angle, which is the main orientation of the blur, and then the standard deviation at both the principal axis and the orthogonal one. And this is a pretty rough model, but if blur is not too large, it's fine. 
then we need to um, estimate the Gaussian parameters of the blur. And we do this using an empirical observation that sharp images have more or less the same maximum gradient intensity on every direction. And, uh, and that if we have Gaussian blur, the image gradient is going to be related to the Gaussian blur standard deviation or covariance matrix. Then, by looking into the image gradient at different directions, we can identify which direction is the most blurry, and then, from the maximum gradient values in that direction under orthogonal 1, estimate the Gaussian parameters. So the idea is that we are going to scan the gradient intensity at a discrete number of different orientations, and then from the minimum value, we can determine the direction of the blur and, the grade, and, and, and also compute or estimate the standard deviation of the Gaussian blur uh, kernel. So this is not a perfect, but it's a fine estimation if the blur is mild. So once we have an estimation of the blur, what we need to solve is a problem of non-blind deblurring. As we mentioned earlier, this is quite an old problem and there are multiple ways of addressing it. Here, we take a novel approach and what we're going to do is we're going to remove the blur by combining different reapplications of the blur. And this might sound a little counterintuitive. But for those who recall, there's something known as the Newman series that can be used, for example, to compute the inverse of an operator. So if we expand this series and truncate it, then what we have is just a polynomial on the blur kernel k. And the idea is that if the blur is small, means that it's going to be close to the identity, so this polynomial actually makes sense. Here you can see the, the trun a truncation of the Newman series for the inverse of the kernel up to order 3. And this actually motivated us to use a polynomial filter as a way to approximate the inverse of the filter blur k. The polynomial coefficients are going to be fixed and set independently of the blur and the image. Applying this polynomial filter amounts to add and subtract multiple reapplications of the estimated blur to the, to the blurry image, as shown in this figure. So we have the blurry input, and then we blur it and blur it a second time and a third time, and then we combine these different applications to generate the, our restoration. The idea is that we are going to set the polynomial coefficients in a way that we invert the blur, but without boosting the noise and our unwanted artifacts. Please check our paper to understand more about the mathematics of this. But since the blur estimation is quite rough, right, and the model might not be super precise, we know that during this deblurring step, we are going to introduce artifacts. In particular, we are going to introduce halos due to oversharpening. Halos can be characterized as pixels where we have gradient reversal, meaning that the gradient on the reconstructed or deblurred image points to the opposite direction as in the input. This means actually that we can detect this pixel that has this gradient reversal. And the idea, or what we do, is we actually generate a blending mask that actually blends the deblurred image and the input in a way that we minimize the gradient reversal. This allows us to remove most of the sharpening artifacts that we see. So let's see some example of polyblur. Here you can see a blurry old picture and the deblurred image on the right and the estimated Gaussian blur kernel. The image looks naturally sharp and most of the blurriness has been compensated. Here you can see another example. Again, on the left, the input, and on the right, the output. Polyblur has been actually integrated into Google Photos. So if you have 
Google Photos, you can actually apply poly, poly blur through the sharpen feature and you can test the behavior. If you want to learn more about uh, poly blur and the integration to Google Photos, you can check our blog post where we detail how this feature is integrated along with a denoiser for improving the quality of images. All right, one may wonder how deep learning has impacted image restoration and in particular image deblurring. The idea is that we can train a deep model using thousands of examples, low quality, high quality, paired examples. And training is done by finding the, the deep model parameters that minimize some loss function. This loss function penalizes the, mis the mismatch between the network prediction and the high resolution or high quality reference target. We can, for example, directly measure the discrepancy in image pixels by computing the square pixel reconstruction error. But as we mentioned earlier, inverse problems such as image deblurring, do not generally have a unique solution. There's typically an infinite number of high-quality images that can lead to the same low-quality observation. This implies that we, when we try to minimize the loss function, the network learns to predict the average of all possible solutions. So even in the best case scenario, where we actually minimize this error perfectly, our predicted image won't necessarily look natural and typically be blurry due to being the average of many possible candidates. To exemplify this issue, this regression to the mean issue, let me show you an example on super resolution. Imagine we train a model to minimize uh, the reconstruction, the L2 reconstruction error. And the idea is we train this model using low resolution and high resolution images. So here you can see that the output of the network in this case is actually pretty blurry, right? It is much sharper than the input, has more defined edges, but doesn't have any detail. So there are multiple recent works that have studied how to define losses that better characterize these perceptual differences. The perceptual loss introduced by Johnson and colleagues a few years ago, also known as content loss, what proposed to do is to compare the target and the generated image on, on a deep feature space, not directly measuring the error on the pixel space, but on a deep feature space. And these deep features are extracted from intermediate representations from a deep model, such as a BGG network pre-trained for image classification. They empirically show that this leads to much better results. But the main problem is that we, are, we will still be suffering the regression to the mean, but now on the deep feature space. So this is not an, opti an optimal solution. An alternative approach is to use an adversarial loss inspired by the generative adversarial networks. The idea is that we are going to try to force the generated images or the reconstruction images to be in the manifold of the high, high resolution or high quality uh, images. And this is done by simultaneously training two networks, a generator restoration network and a discriminator or a critic that learns to distinguish between real or reconstructed images. This training is done in an alternate fashion. The adversarial loss produces highly realistic results but it's hard to control the hallucinated content since it's not reference-based, right? We are just trying the output 
to lay in the high resolution space. And additionally, the training might be unstable due to this alternative minimization or maximization. A couple of years ago, we introduced the projected distribution loss. And the idea is that instead of directly penalizing distance between deep features, what we're going to do is penalize the distance between the distribution of features. And we can use features for similar to the content loss, features that are extracted from a pre-trained classification network. The idea of using the distribution of features is that the features encode relevant high frequency information, such as image sharpness or texture grain. But using the distribution make this feature invariant to small shifts, noise, and other small changes presented in images. So we are going to be in a better position to minimize the, this regression to the mean uh, issue that I previously showed. The idea of this PDL loss is that it's going to serve as a complement to a regular pixel loss. There are fast ways of implementing this loss in the case of unidimensional vectors, right? And we, we exploit that in order to have like a, a fast uh, implementation of this. Please check our papers for more details. Let me show you an example. I showed this exact same blurry image before and this exact same reconstruction. This is done using PD, the PDL loss, right? Uh, and this model has been trained to remove blur using simulated degradations that are motion blur and noise and a slight and, and compression, right? Here you can see a result. We also experiment on this PDL loss to do other reconstruction tasks like denoising and compare to the content loss and other recent work on, on, on perceptual um, restoration. And in general, the PDL loss leads to generated images that have more details than we directly try to minimize the pixel loss or the deep features error. Here you can see uh, a close up on, on the previous image, right? In general, we are generating better reconstruction for, for example, the lion hair than the perceptual loss. Here you can see another example on the blurring. Right on the on the top row, you can see the blur two blurry crops from the input image, and on the bottom the reconstruction. Right, and in general we produce uh, good results, but this method is still sensitive to other issues that are intrinsically related to producing a single reconstruction, as I'm going to to explain in a few minutes. So, very recently, there's been a lot of success on generative models that use denoising diffusion as a strategy for generating new images. And I'm going to show how we can use actually these denoising diffusion strategies to do res res restoration tasks. So, so far, I've been talking about point estimations that seek to generate a single reconstruction from the low quality input. And this is typically done by training a single model that tries to minimize some reconstruction error, either on the pixel space or on the, on, on the deep feature space. And this restoration is done in a single step. That is a single application of this deep model. But as we saw, this may lead to some intrinsic difficulties due to the impulse nature of the inverse problem, right? And this is what we get, for example, if we get the, the reconstruction that minimizes the mean square error, as the one we show here, is very blurry due to this regression to the mean issue. So 
An alternative idea is to try to generate multiple plausible reconstructions, not a single one. And this is more consistent with the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve. Right? We know that there are multiple high-quality images that can lead to the very same observation. So why trying to force the model to learn a single one? Right? And one, and this is not new. I mean, there are, there's previous work trying to do this, uh, very interesting work. And one way to try to do this is by trying to model the distribution of plausible reconstructions. For example, imagine that we are able to generate samples from the posterior distribution. What is the posterior distribution? It's the distribution of high quality images conditioning on observing the blurry input Y, right? If we are able to generate samples of this distribution, then we will have high quality samples compatible to our blurry observation. And I'm going to show how we can do this using a conditional diffusion model. But first, we need to understand what is a diffusion model. So let's do a, a crash course on diffusion models. The idea is the following. Imagine we sample an image from our data distribution, the clean data. And then the idea is that we are going to gradually add noise, for example, white Gaussian noise. And we're going to do this for a number of T steps where T might be very large. Imagine 1000, right? And we add noise little by little, right? If we do this, enough time, at the very end, we will have an image that is dominated by the noise, right? It's just noise. It's just Gaussian noise. So this is the forward diffusion model. It's, a, it's a, a diffusion model in the sense that it is actually adding noise. And the goal in diffusion modeling is to try to reverse this diffusion process. So what we have now is we have a model that takes our data distribution and converts it into a noise or Gaussian noise, which is the prior distribution, a Gaussian distribution. So the big idea of generative diffusion is to try to revert this process, which amounts to remove noise little by little at each step. So imagine we start from a pure noise image and then little by little, we convert it into a real image from our data distribution by removing noise. So more specifically, a diffusion probabilistic model is a Markov chain that converts the data into noise by adding Gaussian noise. A data point in the process only depends on the previous step. So we have this Markov property. In general, the considered distribution of continuous data is, is a Gaussian, where we can control the amount of noise it's added at each step right, by a hyperparameter. The idea is that we start adding very little noise, and then as we move forward, we gradually add more and more noise. So after T steps, we have pure Gaussian distribution. Then the goal is to try to reverse this process. Here is represented by the, this function or distribution Q, right? From the step T, we try to go to the step T minus one which amounts to remove little noise. We don't know this process, but what we're going to try to do is to approximate it using a neural network. And this neural network, it's actually removing noise, so it is a denoiser, right? So I'm not going to present the mathematics of diffusion models, but you get the idea. We, we have like a forward process that actually adds noise, 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 noise. And then we can we want to revert that. So we start from pure noise and then remove noise little by little. So what do we need? We need to get this denoiser model. How do we train it? Well, we sample data from our clean distribution. And then we randomly add noise to this image, a certain amount of noise that is correlated to the time step where we are in this Markov chain. 
and then we train the model to predict the noise or to remove the noise is, is, is similarly, right? And this model is actually the denoiser. So this, what we have at the very end is a model that actually denoises the signal conditioned on the time step that we are t. Okay, so once we, we have this model, we can actually use to generate new train, new data samples from the, from the distribution. How we do that? Well, now we start from the end of the Markov chain, which is pure noise. And then from there, we start applying this denoiser, denoiser network, right? And remove noise little by little. And we go to the previous step and the previous step. And we do this and then the model actually creates new samples start, starting from pure noise. It's, it's very elegant, actually. And this has been actually uh, been used in many recent work that actually produces state-of-the-art quality on image generation conditioning on, the tech, on, on, on a text prompt. So then the idea is slightly different. What I just present is the, the main ideas of a diffusion model where we, we train a, a, a denoiser network to generate new samples. But this denoiser network can be conditioned on a text prompt or a representation of a text prompt to generate images that are related to the text input. So the same idea can be used to do image restoration. But instead of conditioning on the text input, we can condition on the low quality input image, on the low quality blurry signal. So let me present our recent work on this line, which uses diffusion models for doing image deblurring. And we actually call this predict and refine. This joint work with colleagues at the computational imaging team at Google, and also uh, our former intern, Jay Wang, and his advisor. So in the concrete case of image restoration, which can be casted as a conditional generation task, where we want to generate high quality images given the low quality uh, input, right? We can, in many cases, produce a cheap initial guess, right? And then one question is, can we benefit from this initial guess? So to clarify, the idea is that we are going to, to train a diffusion model to generate the reconstructions, conditions on the blurry input. But do we need to train the denoiser to generate new samples? Or maybe we can start from an initial prediction and then learn it from there. And this is exactly what we do. Imagine that we have the blurry input, right? We have a, a first model, G, that actually gives us an initial prediction. And then what we want to do is this diffusion model to learn the residual with respect to the initial prediction. This residual will model, ideally, the details that are missing in the initial prediction. So we are going to train these two networks, the initial prediction and the noiser network, condition it on the blurry input, right? In a way that we can generate high quality reconstructions. Then we combine the residual and the initial prediction to generate the sample. So how we do this? Well, exactly the same as we train a diffusion model. The difference is that now this denoiser network that will start from noise and generate the high quality output, first, it will be conditioned on the noise level of the, of the step T in the Markov chain, right? But it will, be, it will be also be conditioned on the low quality input because we don't want to generate any high quality image. We want to generate high quality images that are actually per to the to the to the low quality input that we're seeing <clears throat> that is one of the main difference and the other is that the initial the noising network is not going to actually model the high quality signal but the residual with respect to the initial prediction but then we are going to train 
um, the two models, the prediction G and the denoiser F, by minimizing this denoising loss, similarly as how, is, how the denoising diffusion models are trained. We require for doing this per data, low quality and high quality, and, the, and then the same scheme of adding noise and removing noise. So we do this and then we can generate multiple samples. The idea is that we have the initial prediction and then we apply the diffusion model to generate the full sample. So as you saw, we didn't enforce anything in particular to the initial prediction. There is no reason why the initial prediction will make something reasonable. But interestingly, the output looks like some sort of average of all possible samples. It is actually removing some blur on the input and some noise, right? But it doesn't have the details. The details are provided by the denoising residual model that we train. Here you can see another example. The initial prediction looks sharper but lacks the details. And then once we apply enough steps of the diffusion models, we get a right a nice sample. We compare our results to state-of-the-art deep deblurring methods trained on the same training data set. And we compare many different metrics, perceptual metrics like LPIPs, NIQE, FID or KID, and distortion metrics such as PSNR or structural similarity index. So first, since we are not directly trying to minimize reconstruction error, the distortion metrics for our method are not state of the art, but the perceptual metrics, they are state of the art. We significantly improve, uh, beat the, the, for example, the FID metric to other distortion based reconstructions, right? For a large margin. But since we are not directly trying to minimize the reconstruction error, we are not doing a, a, like the best job there. But one thing that we, we can do is, since we are actually trying to generate multiple samples from the posterior, we can actually average many of those samples and then generate a new estimate that is the average of all the possible samples. And we call that our sample averaging. And as you can see on the bottom uh, row of this table, if we do this, then we can actually generate state-of-the-art results on PSNR, which is not the main focus. We are not super interested in that because we are more interested in perceptual quality. But it's interesting to show that with a single method, by averaging different number of samples, we can actually generate different uh, perceptual distortion combinations. And actually, there is something known as the perception distortion trade-off introduced by Blau and Michaeli in 2017 that says the following, says that we, can act we cannot actually minimize the distortion error and the perceptual uh, and, and maximize the perceptual quality simultaneously. If you minimize the distortion error, then you are not going to be optimal in terms of perceptual quality. And this makes sense because we know that for minimizing the distortion error, we actually need to do, for example, the, the posterior mean. And this is actually not a great image because it might not be one uh, it, it might not be a high quality a, a high quality image, it, right? It might not be a, a, an image that is coming from a from a high probability part of the distribution of images, right? But if we do samples of the posterior, then we can actually maximize the perceptual quality in the reconstruction at the expense of not minimizing the distortion. But by averaging different number of of sample, of reconstructed samples, we can traverse this distortion perception trade-off. So to finish this part, let me show you one more result on the blurring, right? Here you can see a regression baseline, which is a network trained to remove blur in one shot directly from the input, right? And it lacks details. 
While if we do this approach that actually tries to generate samples from the posterior, we actually generate a new image that is closer visually to the reference, even if the distortion with respect to the reference is larger than the, than the regression baseline. So with that, uh, that finalizes the core part of my talk, but I wanted to show you a little more beyond the status of the blurring, beyond academic work. And for that, let me present briefly a feature that we launched last year in Pixel Phones that is known as Photo and Blur. Photo and Blur is a feature available on Pixel 7 phones that manages to correct blur noise on new and old photos. So, for example, imagine you capture this photograph and this is what it gives photo and blur. It removes blur. And let me show you a, a short clip from, from a Super Bowl ad promoting this feature that appeared on television in the Super Bowl a few months ago. So this is a very challenging problem in the sense that we are applying it in the wild with any photograph from any user, right? And let me show you, a, for example, a few examples, typical examples that we see. This is an image that has blur, noise, and compression artifacts. This is the result of photon blur. This is running on the device. Another example where here, we also corrected the light with another feature that is available on the phone. And another example. And with that, let me thank you for the opportunity of presenting our work and I'm happy to take questions.